In the 1930s, the RAF urgently needed a heavy fighter capable of long-range escort missions as the threat of war approached. The answer was the Westland Whirlwind fighter, an aircraft that was anything but conventional. Taking flight months before the war broke out, its twin Rolls-Royce engines gave it a speed that left many of its contemporaries in the dust. But speed wasn't its only asset. Armed with four devastating Hispano-Suiza cannons, it aimed to protect bombers deep in enemy territory. Its wings, crafted for precision and agility, were envisioned for swift, low-level attacks against any target. A true innovation for its time, its bubble canopy gave pilots unparalleled visibility, a crucial advantage in the chaotic, war-torn skies. Yet, despite its cutting-edge technology and formidable armaments, the Westland battled itself with each sortie to take over the glory of immortal aircraft such as the Hurricane and Spitfire. In the mid-1930s, the United Kingdom commenced an aggressive expansion of aircraft development. Although Britain had been producing them since World War I, a possible war with the rising Third Reich loomed on the horizon, and Britain wished to be prepared. Germany's Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine were in an ambitious arms race to overcome the might of the Royal Navy and Air Force. Although the RAF had already developed the Hurricane and the Spitfire, which were on par with the latest Germany had to offer, they were armed with basic American-made Browning machine guns and had a short range. Aviation specialists expected that a long range armed with a heavy cannon was required for a new age of air warfare, where bombers required escort fighters with proper range and armament to protect them from enemy interceptors deep in hostile territory. In 1935, the British Air Ministry realized it urgently required an aircraft armed with a 20mm cannon and issued Operational Requirement F-3735, calling for a single-seat, all-weather heavy fighter armed with four Hispano 20mm cannons. In addition, the aircraft required a top speed of at least 330 miles per hour, which was over 40 miles more than the average British bomber, while flying at altitudes of 15,000 feet. Several aircraft manufacturers presented their designs in 1937. Westland Aircraft, based in Yeovil in Somerset, presented its P-9 design. It featured a tubular monocoque fuselage with a T-tail at the end and was fitted with two Rolls-Royce Kestrel engines, mounted in pods beneath the low wings and the desired four 20mm cannons housed in the nose. The canopy on the P-9 was a unique innovation for British aircraft, providing the pilot with excellent all-around vision and turning the design into the first of its kind for British airplanes. The P-9 also featured two retractable main wheels and a single retractable tail wheel. The Kestrel engine that powered it was also employed in aircraft such as the Hawker Fury biplane fighter and the Handley Page Hayford biplane bomber. The first flight of the new aircraft took place in October 1938. The all-metal prototype made an impression among the spectators, as aircraft like the Hawker Hurricane still featured doped linen surfaces. Testing was accelerated as tensions with Adolf Hitler increased in the geopolitical sphere. Germany had risen again. The annexation of Austria and other territories led to new tensions with Britain and France, and war became probable. While the Air Ministry considered immediately ordering the whirlwind into production, it was decided to replace the Kestrel with the upgraded and supercharged Peregrine Rolls-Royce engine that provided over 850 horsepower, an increase of 200 horsepower over the Kestrel. In early 1939, with tensions under full swing across all of Western Europe, the Air Ministry put an order in for 200 Westland Whirlwind aircraft. The Whirlwinds were fitted with the new Peregrine engine and armed with the desired four Hispano Mark I 20mm cannons built with the license of the French Hispano-Suiza HS-404 cannon. This made the Whirlwind one of the most powerful aircraft of its time, but the cannons were prone to jamming and limited to magazines of just 60 rounds. The first production Whirlwind flew in June 1940, at the time France was surrendering its armies to the triumphant Reich, and the British were withdrawing from Dunkirk. Initial deliveries began in July 1940, but only to Royal Air Force Squadrons 137 and 263. Both units welcomed the aircraft and reported it was reliable, stable, and fast at low altitudes. Still, it wasn't perfect. Performance dropped significantly as the aircraft approached its service ceiling of around 30,000 feet. Additionally, due to its high landing speed, the Westland Whirlwind could not be used on short airstrips. Still, with its maximum speed of over 360 miles per hour, the Whirlwind was on par with fighters such as the Spitfire, greatly surpassing the latter when it came to operational range as it doubled the 400 miles of early Spitfire models. Although the Westland Whirlwind was in service with the 263rd Squadron during the Battle of Britain, 
it did not see combat during the country's desperate fight against the German Air Force. The squadron was located in Scotland, and no decision was made to move it to England. By the time the unit was declared operational in December 1940, the battle and the German threat of taking over the island were no more. In early 1941, it became evident to the British High Command that Britain needed every Spitfire and Hurricane the industry could produce to keep fighting the Germans without additional support from other Allied troops. Consequently, to streamline production and develop more aircraft, Rolls-Royce decided to focus development only on the more powerful Merlin engine used on both the Hurricane and Spitfire, leading to a complete halt of the Peregrine engine employed by the Westland Whirlwind. No further Peregrine engines were produced as a result. The lack of production engines also meant that production of the Whirlwind effectively ended after only 11 aircraft were delivered. The last of them to come out of production was delivered to the RAF in early January 1942. Although the Westland Whirlwind missed its opportunity to participate in Britain's greatest moment of defiance when it stood alone against the might of the Wehrmacht, it still saw combat during those critical months in which the United Kingdom desperately fought off the German Luftwaffe with little Allied support. The few British pilots who were lucky enough to fly the aircraft against the enemy praised its performance and handling in combat. Such was the case of Sergeant G. L. Buckwell from 263rd Squadron. The Briton was shot down while engaging hostile forces over the skies of Cherbourg, France, and later, when asked about his flight experience aboard a Western whirlwind, he said it was, quote, great to fly. We were a privileged few. In retrospect, the lesson of the whirlwind is clear. A radical aircraft requires either prolonged development or widespread service to exploit its concept and eliminate its weaknesses. Too often in World War II, such aircraft suffered accelerated development or limited service, with the result that teething difficulties came to be regarded as permanent limitations. Generally, the few proud airmen who flew the whirlwind regarded it with the utmost respect and affection. But not everything was sunshine and rainbows. Some renowned pilots from the Royal Navy such as Captain Eric Melrose Winkle Brown, an officer and test pilot that flew over 490 aircraft, regarded the whirlwind as a great disappointment due to it being severely underpowered when compared to other British aircraft already fighting toe-to-toe against the Axis fighters. Some of these complaints gave emphasis to the high landing speed of the wing design. Due to the limited production of the Peregrine engines, no whirlwind redesign was ever contemplated to get rid of the problem. Following the end of the Battle of Britain, the Westland Whirlwinds were still employed against the enemy, despite their limited numbers. The Whirlwind squadrons flew low-level attacks across the English Channel in occupied France. The aircraft saw some success against German fighters at low-level encounters. In February 1941, one Whirlwind shot down a German Arado AR-196 floatplane near the English Channel. However, the cost to pay was high, as the British aircraft lost control during the dogfight and crashed into the sea, taking the pilot to the depths. Other Westland Whirlwind units were also employed for reconnaissance and convoy patrols, scouting the ocean from above to spot German Kriegsmarine submarines and e-boats of fast attack craft that roamed the English Channel. Despite being limited to operating in the English Channel and northern France, the Westland Whirlwinds had their fair share of occasional combat encounters with other Axis aircraft, such as Germany's powerful Focke-Wulf FW-190s, Messerschmitt BF-109s, Junkers JU-88s, and Dornier DO-217 bombers. The 263rd Squadron also participated in occasional daytime bomber escort missions in late 1941 and early 1942. In August 1941, the Westland Whirlwinds made good use of their 20mm cannons during an escort mission of 54 Blenheim bombers that conducted a raid against the German power stations in Cologne. Although the Whirlwinds proved their power, their short range forced them to leave the British bombers near Antwerp, Belgium. As a result, the Blenheims continued the raid alone and were preyed upon by German interceptors that destroyed over 10 bombers with relative ease. The Westland Whirlwinds, making use of their excellent low-level flying capabilities, also participated in anti-shipping strikes. The four British fighters were abruptly intercepted by a squadron of Messerschmitt BF-109s and managed to shoot down three enemies at the cost of minimal damage to their airframes. These small successes paved the way for the formation of Squadron 137 in September 1941, whose sole task was to attack railway targets in occupied France and Belgium. Despite the creation of the new unit, the Western Whirlwind began to reach the end of its life cycle. Spare parts began to run short, and with the British military streamlining production only to its most popular fighters, the end of the aircraft was only a matter of time. 
there was some discussion among the top brass to resume production of the Whirlwind by fitting it with the Merlin engine, but this required a major redesign of the entire aircraft. This was simply not possible due to Britain's desperate need to produce aircraft as fast as possible to keep the enemy on its toes. The Merlin engine was larger and one-third heavier than the Peregrine, further complicating the redesign and aerodynamics of the Whirlwind. Thus, the British military concluded it was best to focus on the development of the Spitfire and other single-engine fighters at the expense of the Westland Whirlwind. Nevertheless, the Westland Whirlwind still found a purpose. 67 of 116 Mark I aircraft built were converted to the Westland Whirlwind II, or Mark II, a single-seat fighter-bomber configuration with underwing racks. The Mark II could carry up to two 500-pound bombs. These fighter-bomber variants were dubbed Mark II World Bombers, and they proved to be very effective in their new role in several raids across the English Channel. Westland engineers also came up with two experimental prototypes that never made it to full production. One of them was a single night fighter model that served with the 25th Squadron and was armed with 12 7.7mm machine guns or a single powerful 37mm cannon. One damaged Westland whirlwind was given to the U.S. Navy for evaluation in late 1942 and was transferred to Naval Air Station Pensacola in Florida. The Navy disliked the fighter's performance and only used it for gunnery evaluation before scrapping it in mid-1944. The last combat operation of a whirlwind took place in June 1943 against a Luftwaffe airfield at Poix, northeastern France. Weeks later, the surviving whirlwinds were retired from service and replaced by Hurricane Mark IIs and Hawker Typhoons. 263rd and 137th squadrons never got to fly their cherished Westland whirlwinds again. Despite being a capable fighter for the ground attack role, the whirlwind was severely limited by its design which was entirely based around an engine that was unreliable and underpowered. The surviving aircraft were dispatched to No. 18 Maintenance Unit Royal Air Force at Dumfries, Scotland, where they were scrapped one by one. Only one whirlwind was retained by Westland. This last airworthy piece of British aviation history was used as an executive transport for the company. Still, age eventually caught up to the aircraft, and it was scrapped in 1947, leading to the demise of the last example of the model, and making the Westland Whirlwind the forgotten British fighter. Following the end of the war, Westland focused on developing and manufacturing helicopters, particularly American Sikorsky S-55s. Ironically, one of the company's first helicopters was named the Westland Whirlwind in the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy.